Uh, my name's Dave Gussmer. I am one of the owners of Gussmer. We are still family owned and operated. I oversee our beverage sales. And uh, years ago, I used to be the product manager for cross-flow filtration for Booker. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit. And I hope the, the morning sessions, you found that this was really not a sales pitch. And even though I oversee our beverage sales, that this is not going to be a sales pitch. This is gonna be just a very technical presentation on the benefits of cross-flow, what are the pros, what are some of the cons. I am gonna be most familiar with the Booker system because that is what we do sell. So I'm not pushing Booker, but I am gonna be probably referencing some things that's using the Booker design. So uh, we do have a smaller group here, so please make it interactive. If you have any questions, comments, or disagreements, feel free to chime in, and I would love to get your feedback. So let's dive in. What I'm gonna talk about today, First, I'm gonna do an overview on the definition. What is cross-flow filtration? How does it differ from the other filter methods that we talked about in the morning? I'll go over a basic design, talk about some of the applications where you can use cross-flow. I will touch upon some of the advantages and some of the disadvantages, particularly how they compare to DE, filter sheets, bag filters, any of the other systems that we've talked about. Talk about some sizing and cost, then I'm gonna to touch upon some opportunities where you can use cross-flow filtration for juice lees filtration or wine lees. And this is not just the Booker system. A lot of other competitors have some opportunities where you can use their equipment for juice and wine lees filtration. And then I'll finish up with some tips on buying. So what is cross-flow? It is defined as tangential flow filtration, also called TFF defined as a method of clarification where the product flow is parallel to the surf filter surface and that minimizes clogging and maximizes efficiency. This slide, I think, gives the best description on what cross-flow is all about and how it's different from the other filter methods that our guys talked about earlier this morning. This top section here is called dead-end filtration. Anything that Nate Bill or Rob talked about this morning is really categorized as dead-end filtration. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing, but what it's doing is that we are building up a filter cake. We're running the product to be filtered, which is wine, at a 90-degree angle against your filter element. That's true if it's DE, filter sheets, a membrane, any other type of filter, you're going at that 90-degree angle. We're building up this cake, and as I think Rob had talked about, this is actually getting tighter and you're getting cleaner filtrate coming off the filter when you have dead end filtration. Cross flow is just the opposite. We're not going against this filter media, we're going across it. We're running our filter, our wine, at a parallel system to the filter media, so we are keeping all of these contaminants in suspension. We're not building up a cake. So this does a couple of things. It's almost getting a self-cleaning mechanism going on, and uh, it's not clogging, because we're not building up that cake. This is an overview of the system. This is an, a four-module system. So each of these four modules has probably 3,000 of these capillary straws. We're gonna take this apart one by one, but I just wanna give you a quick snapshot. We are running the wine from the top to the bottom, through these canisters, through these capillary straws. If we took one of those modules off, and you're looking at it from the top angle, you would see these 3,000 capillaries. There's a resin system here, this uh, kind of brown plastic resin pr product that you see here. This actually is throughout the top of this entire module. You can see pieces of this brown resin. The only way for wine to get in the middle of that canister is to go through the top of those straws. That resin is about an inch thick. So you're not gonna get any bypass. The only way for it to go through is to get through those straws, going back into the original picture, so that's why we're keeping it in that loop. So if we took a piece of that stainless steel element off and you wanted to look inside, you'd see all of these capillary straws. Wine can either go through, staying in that loop, the only place for that wine to go is through the capillary straw, through the filter element. So only part of the liquid is passing through the membrane. 
what is happening is that the coarser material, the coarse components, which we're going to call retentate, retentate is anything that doesn't go through the membrane, the retentate is getting more concentrated as you go along. And what's coming at the end is your filtrate or permeate, which is your filtered wine. So as I mentioned, during the course of filtration, that retentate is getting more and more concentrated. And at the end, what you should be left with is just brilliant, clear wine and a very high solids retentate. So again, this is your tank to be filtered. This is your clean wine tank. Basic design, you have, this is just one module for the sake of the diagram. Your feed pump is normally gonna be a positive displacement pump. This is your variable speed pump. This guy, this is your workhorse. This circulation pump is just circulating the wine over the modules. This is the, really the key pump right here. So what exactly are we removing? We're gonna talk about microns, and we've talked about that this morning. Cross flow is normally at this 0.1 to 0.2 micron level. We want to remove anything looser than that 0.2, so that's gonna be yeast and bacteria. These are the primary things that you guys are looking to remove. We're not gonna go any tighter than 0.1. That would be the category of RO, reverse osmosis, or nanofiltration or ultrafiltration. So we're just gonna focus on cross flow this afternoon. We want to take out yeast and bacteria. What we don't want to take out are the good components, the proteins, colloids, organic dissolved salts. Uh, again, some of these could be removed with RO if you were looking for VA reduction or alcohol removal. But again, we're not going to focus on that today. I think Rob had a good slide talking about the soup. So what are these particles in wine that we're trying to remove in your soup? Uh, grape solids, tartrates, finding agents. We are trying to remove those. They're gonna be around 100 to 1,000 microns in size. Your colloids or your proteins, they're gonna be a bit smaller. You're looking at 0.2 to 5 microns. Yeast and bacteria is 0.65 to 3. We've had a lot of talk this morning about microns, and I think it begs the question of, you know, what is a micron? And Rob defined it as one millionth of a meter. I have a tough time wrapping my head around this. Okay, it's, it's, it's 30, 39 millionths of an inch. I'm still thinking, you know, you know, what the heck is a micron? So I have a picture which might help. This large circle would be a fine grain of sand. So a fine grain of sand is gonna be about 500 microns in diameter. You would be able to fit a drop of mist into that fine piece of sand a drop of mist is about 100 microns. A red blood cell is about five microns. So that would fit inside your drop of mist. Here you have your yeast cell and your bacteria at three microns and 0.65. So I think this picture kind of puts it in perspective. You know, what is a micron? What is 0.65 microns? Just to give you a little bit of history on cross flow. It started in the 1940s, and it started mainly as a water filter. So it, it was quite common. They took that water filter and tried to uh, bring it into the wine industry at about the 1980s. And if any of you were making wine back in the 1980s, you might remember that the uh, initial cross flow units in the market did not go very well. A lot of problems. It was heating the wine. It was beating up the wine. Um, just very poor quality, very expensive. So it was a bit of a disaster. So there are a lot of modifications happened to improve the system with Crossflow. And this is not just Bucher, this is all the suppliers out there. They came up with a new membrane that is specifically made for wine filtration, not the water membrane that they had with Crossflow. They did a lot of improvements with the back flush system. The back flush is key to having good flow rates. You're keeping those contaminants in suspension. You're not clogging your filter media, but you still are getting some plugging. The way you're gonna minimize that plugging is by having a back flush. We'll talk about that a little bit later. We wanna run cross flow at a low pressure if possible. That is probably the biggest detriment is that we're heating up the wine because we're running these things at such a high pressure. I will say the Bucher system runs at a very low pressure at about 0.7 to 1.2 bar maximum. So that's the way that we're addressing this heating issue. 
Cross-flow filters now have a much more efficient cleaning system. Uh, even with the back flush, you are gonna get some clogging or plugging, so there are some systems to try to minimize that. Today's cross flows are much easier to use. They're fully automated. You can still get a manual system, but the majority of them are gonna be fully automated, so they're very user-friendly. There are three types of membranes that you could find in a cross flow filter. The first one would be hollowed fiber, there's spiral round, and then there's a ceramic. You don't see many spiral round. In fact, I don't know if any supplier in the market is making that. Most of the uh, filter suppliers today are gonna do the hollowed fiber or the ceramic. Bucher has the hollow fiber, so I'm gonna focus on that primarily this afternoon. You can see, as I mentioned, this is a membrane that was made specifically for wine filtration. And what they mean by that, we wanna have a membrane that's not gonna absorb the good quality components that you're trying to leave in the wine. We're gonna talk about this 0.2 micron membrane. So we've talked about what a micron is. Most suppliers, Bucher included, have a 0.2 micron membrane. And the reason being, a lot of people said, why, why is it so tight? I'd rather get something like a 0.45 or 0.8, or just have options where I can open up the porosity. The reason there's a 0.2 micron is we're actually getting better flow rate at 0.2 than if we were to open up that pore structure. Now, as Bill said in his talk, it's not as if this is a sheet in every one of those pores is exactly 0.2 microns. Even on the capillary tube itself, there is some depth, if you will. So we're taking out particles that are 0.2. It's not as if that pore size is 0.2. But if we were to open up the pore structure and have it more of a 0.45 or, or 0.5, you're actually gonna get more clogging if you try to open it up. And the reason being is that if we open it up, you're getting more of an opportunity for contaminants to get caught. So it seems counterintuitive, but by tightening it to 0.2, you're flowing across here, you actually get less clogging. So it's pretty interesting how that works. So that's why almost every cross-flow supplier has a 0.2 micron capillary or membrane, or even the ceramics, because of that reason. Now this is a good picture. Nate talked about asymmetric versus symmetric. Bucher has an asymmetric membrane, meaning the pore size, the pore distribution, or, or hole size, actually gets uh, more open as you go through the, the filter media. Whereas in a symmetric, the pore structure is pretty comparable throughout the whole course. The reason we have it asymmetric is that we have a very efficient back flush. The back flush is really critical to the Bucher system, so that's why they went with the asymmetric. There are some advantages that Nate touched upon in terms of bubble point testing and all, why symmetric could be used. But we're talking about two different animals with a cartridge filter versus uh, cross flow, so that's why uh, we go with the asymmetric. So this is a little animation to point out one feature about cross-flow that we want to point out. These polyphenols, these are the good things in your wine that we're trying to uh, uh, keep. They will go through the, the capillaries, but a lot of times these polyphenols are gonna break apart. What happens is over time, those polyphenols do break apart once they go through your cross-flow, but they do come back together. There is some filtration shock, if you will. The reason I want to point this out on this slide is because DE or filter sheets, you guys probably always come across this filtration shock. It seems to be worse with cross flow. For whatever reason, when you first taste the wine out of the filter, it does taste very beat up or flat or limp, but the wine does come back together. So don't freak out if you do a demo with cross flow and you, and you say, what the heck just happened to my wine? Uh, it will come back together. So where can you do cross flow? You can do filtration of juice prior to adding your yeast. If you wanna do a juice settling um, and you wanna clean it up before you uh, inoculate, you, you can use cross flow for that. We do point out, you do wanna make sure that you have juice that's pectin free. So you do wanna treat it with a pectinase. Pectins can plug up your cross flow filters. You can use cross flow to arrest or prevent alcoholic or malolactic fermentation. Let's say you wanna leave a little bit of RS in your wine. You can run it through the cross flow filter to stop the fermentation. 
if you have done a fining regime with either bentonite, uh, which we'll talk about, uh, gelatin, colloidal silica, carbon, a lot of times you want to clean up the wine with cross flow after fining, it's a great opportunity. This is far and away the most popular application for cross flow. We are going to hit it just before the bottling line, just before your millipore cartridge. Uh, this is probably 80% to 90% of where we're using cross flow filtration. And in essence, what we're doing is we're taking very dirty wine, 800 NTU or higher, putting it through the cross flow filter, and you're coming out with one NTU wine that's brilliantly clear and you're hitting that in one pass. So we'll talk about some of these advantages later. Even though we do this back flush, you still need to clean the filter. And you can clean it with hot water. You can do a cold water rinse followed by a hot water rinse, but mostly you need to use a chemical cleaning. And the chemical cleaners that we recommend are caustic. Uh, chlorinated caustic is really effective for cleaning these. Obviously you guys want to shy away from using chlorine. So we do have some options with, uh, you can use non-chlorinated caustic. You just need to make sure that you have hydrogen peroxide as an oxidizing agent. Some people if, will use enzymes to actually clean their cross flow filter. If you've hit it with a really dirty wine and the chemicals aren't able to unclog some of the, uh, the capillaries, a lot of times adding some enzymes, particularly a pectinase, can help clean the, the, uh, the cross flow capillaries. So what are the advantages of cross flow? I touched upon this earlier. It's one pass filtration. You're not using a coarse DE followed by a polished DE, then a tight DE followed by a filter sheet. We had some wineries that had five filtration steps. You cut all of them out to one with cross flow. Because you're only moving the wine once, there's minimal wine transfer, so less oxidation. You have improved wine quality because you're not moving it, because you're not oxidizing the wine. DE or cellulose filter sheets can absorb a lot of color. You've seen it when you take the, the sheets out of the press. There's a lot of beautiful color that gets caught in there. You don't see the color loss when you're using cross flow. There's just the, the cost savings of not having any consumable uh, products such as DE or filter sheets or bag filters or whatever you're using. You don't have the flavor issues associated with DE or sheets. If you're doing a citric rinse to try to get some of that cellulose flavor out of a filter sheet, you no longer have to do that with cross flow. You don't have the disposal issues with DE or sheets. And most importantly, you don't have any health issues with DE. You don't have to wear a mask if you're operating the, uh, the cross flow filter. This is probably one of the biggest Advantages is just the time and labor savings. You don't need two people to load the filter press or to uh, you know, monitor the DE filter. Your wine losses are minimal. Uh, Rob talked about the leakage that you have with the filter sheets. You don't have any of that with CrossFlow. This is interesting. So you still need a 0.45 or 0.65 membrane on the outlet of your cross flow before going into the bottling line. The reason being, as Bill talked about, you, you have to do a bubble point test on those cartridges. You can't do a bubble point test on cross flow. There's a different type of integrity test, but you're not getting the retention that you're getting with an absolute rated cartridge. But we have found that cross flow filtered wine tends to protect membranes way better than DE or sh filter sheets. So since we sell filter membranes, it kind of hurts us as a supplier. It's not good for us because we're selling less cartridges. It is good for you guys. Units are fully automated, so very easy to operate. Uh, one operator could just hook up a couple of hoses, punch in a couple of buttons, and you're good to go. I would say half of our customers run their cross flow filters overnight. Clearly, you have to have the comfort level to do that, and uh, it takes some time to get that. But there's some real savings. If you can run this unattended overnight, you come back and your tank is, is done. What are some of the disadvantages of cross flow? If you already have a DE filter or plate and frame filter, uh, clearly you have to outlay some money to get the initial equipment. Uh, we'll talk about cost in a few minutes. In general, 
the flow rates with cross flow are gonna be slower than what you'd achieve with DE or filter sheets. We talked about this at lunch, that uh, you really can't beat the flow rates that you're getting with DE, it is quite good. Uh, cross flow is gonna be a little bit slower. If you plug a module, it is expensive to replace these. And we'll talk about bentonite. I think Nate had mentioned bentonite is really bad for filtration. This is especially true with cross flow. And if you plug one of these modules, you've actually plugged all of them. So our modules go for about 10 grand a piece. So if you have a six module unit, it kind of hurts to spend 60 grand to replace those. So that's a big drawback. Bentonite will plug these membranes. I think this is an important point. If you don't want to filter all your wines to 0.45 or 0.65, our modules are 0.2, nominal, uh, you might not want to go with cross flow because if you just want to do a coarse filtration at five micron or one micron, uh, this doesn't give you a lot of that variability. So you're better off using sheets or cartridges or DE. Let's talk about sizing and cost. Smallest unit will do about 150 to 350 gallons an hour. So 150 gallons an hour if you have a very high solids, uh, dirty red wine, 350 gallons an hour if it's a clean Sauvignon Blanc. The smallest unit that I have seen is about 25,000 bucks. So that's for a small unit, it will be very manual. This is brand new, but uh, that is what I have seen on the market. So they have come down quite a bit in cost. It is tough to compare vendors, meaning if you get a quote for a 60 square meter filter from supplier A, and they tell you what the flow rates are, and you want to compare it to supplier B, their 60 square meter filter may not give you the same flow rate as supplier A. So just keep that in mind that not all flow rates and not all suppliers are alike. So don't just make it a square meter comparison. The largest units that we make are going to go up to about 15,000 gallons an hour. So we do have some very large wineries that are using cross flow. Uh, it's still not going to match DE, but it is, you still can get some pretty substantial flow rates. This is a nice advantage. A lot of suppliers have uh, cross flow systems that are expandable. You can add more modules as your filtration needs increase. So if you don't want to spend the money up front for a very large unit, you can add banks of membranes to when you get to that point. In general, there's probably 800 to 1,000 cross-flow filters throughout the wine market in the United States. So clearly, cross-flow has made a lot of advancements. It is very popular. And we'll talk about this, how it helps you guys. There's at least 13 suppliers of cross-flow filtration. There's probably four or five that are really, really popular, but the fact that there's just so many people coming up with new technology, you guys have a lot of options at your disposal. This is a great advantage, and we talked about this at lunch. There's a lot of outfits that offer mobile cross-flow filtration. So if you don't have the money to invest in cross-flow, or if you just want to test the water by seeing, hey, how does this technology work? There are so many outfits that offer mobile cross-flow. So that's a great opportunity to save some bucks and try it out to see what you think. Before we talk about uh, some opportunities with juice lees, and we're gonna talk about wine lees. Any questions or comments on just cross flow in general? That is a great question, and we probably had six people during yesterday's session ask that very question, so I should have incorporated that. And unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you. It really varies on the wine. We tell people that if you're gonna membrane filter the wine, um, you probably wanna wait no more than five to seven days before you send it through the, the, the membrane filter. If you wait any longer than five to seven days, you might plug the membranes. Now your question of how long does it take for that wine to get to, together, it could be that five to seven day period because that's what's plugging up the membranes. But we had a winemaker yesterday who said that she has filtered a red wine and through the crossflow filter, and she could wait two months before it had any impact on her membranes. Another winemaker said, if I do it within two days, I'm done. So it really varies on the wine. We tell people it's gonna come back together probably in four to five days, but it really does vary. 
Any other questions? Sir? A little bit, I will touch upon it, yes. Because we do, there are, it's kind of some of the drawbacks. There are capillary uh, straws that will break. So, actually I'll talk about it right now. So the, the straws, one of the advantages of ceramic is it's a little bit more durable than the organic membranes. One of the disadvantages is that the ceramic is not really doing the filtration of the wine. There's a metallic layer and that wears off over time. So ceramics are gonna give you more durability. If you have an organic membrane, those capillary straws will break. You do not have to replace them, but you can repair them. And you isolate the straw so that you take it out of the system, but there is some labor involved with that. And each supplier is gonna have a technique for how you can isolate those straws. One of the things I'll talk about at the end is we highly recommend a turbidity meter, because that will pick up if you have a capillary straw issue. So is that addressing your repairs? And at the end, if, if there's more questions, we can talk about it. Anything else before I dive into juice leaves and wine leaves? Okay. There are some neat opportunities for you guys for before even getting into fermentation. Let's say you're bringing in your white fruit, you pressed it, enzyme treated it, you have 100 hectoliters of Sauvignon Blanc. You're gonna let that Sauvignon Blanc settle overnight. What you're left with is 90 hectoliters of pretty clean juice. And at the bottom, here you got these 10 hectoliters of rather high solids juice leaves. We're gonna send this 90 hectoliters to fermentation. You're gonna inoculate it with your yeast. Crossflow gives you the opportunity to take these 10 hectoliters, run it through the crossflow, and you can send that filtrate right back to your initial tank, and what we're left with is very low losses, one hectoliter of retentate, if you will. So you're getting a 99% efficiency. The beauty of this system is that you're getting really high quality juice, and you're getting very low losses. And the way we do this is we're taking your wine crossflow filter, and we're gonna swap out those three modules, and we're gonna outfit it with a different set of modules, which I'll show you in a second. We're gonna outfit it with what's called a juice lees module. It's gonna have these same capillaries. This is what's in your wine crossflow filter. This is your 0.2 micron capillary straw. This is also 0.2 microns, but this is one and a half millimeters in diameter. This is three millimeters in diameter. Having the larger diameter allows higher solids, so we can tolerate higher solids. The disadvantage is that we can only fit half as many of these capillary straws as we can with the 1.5. So these juice leaves modules are great for high solids juice. They are not good on wine because the flow rate is really bad. These are great on wine because we can fit a ton of these things in the module. They're not good on juice leaves because the solids is too high. So that's why we have one capillary for juice, one capillary for wine. So there's still this pre-filter that we use to take out some of the, you know, the main seeds and stems from, the, we're just filtering those 10 hectoliters. Not, not the whole 100, just the 10. So we're gonna filter the 10 through this, and then we're gonna filter the juice through these juice leaves modules, and we have these little wipers that keep some of the, the solids off the top. But uh, it's a great opportunity, yes sir? For juice leaves, I think we can go as high as 40%. Uh, I don't know if Nate is here. It might be 65%, at least for the Booker system. So at, at, I think we start at 40%, but we can concentrate it. We can go as high as 65%. It's even a little bit higher when we talk about the wine leaves. Sir? Uh, how does it deal with uh, or do with juice leaves that have started from we have had some issues with that. Uh, it is gonna stop the fermentation, obviously, so it will remove the yeast, but your flow rates, it, it does plug it up rather quickly, so we have had some flow issues doing that. It is better if the juice leaves is not fermenting. Once it starts fermenting, it does wreak some havoc, but it can be done, but you're just gonna have to run more cleaning cycles, and your flow rates are gonna be pretty, pretty low. 
Any other questions? Okay. So here's some good pictures, guys. This is the 10 hectoliters that was settled. This is pretty high solid stuff. This is the clarity of the juice coming off that juice lease filter. And this is what that retentate looks like at the end. So you can see it's pretty high solid. But the, the real advantage is this is just great clarity juice that you're getting. And you can add that right back to your initial tank. We also have a cross flow filter for wine lees. The wine lees filter is using not a capillary tube, it's using a stainless steel tube. So it is very, very durable. It's a similar concept. Here's what the stainless capillary looks like. We have this, there's a metallic layer on top of this. The beauty of this, it's very, very durable. We can do any type of juice, or pardon me, any type of wine lees, the bentonite, carbon, tartrate crystals, any type of fining agent. It's, it's pretty much bulletproof. The disadvantage is it's very, very slow. So a lot of winemakers say, well, why don't I just put all my wine, I'll get one cross flow filter, I'll get the stainless steel one, and I'm gonna do everything on it. Your flow rates are gonna be just, it's cost prohibitive. So that's why we have one cross flow for wine, we have a different element for juice lees, we have this stainless steel one for wine lees. And pretty much all the other suppliers have something similar. It's not as if you have one filter that can do all three. So the beauty, as I said, it can tolerate any type of fining agent. You're getting a much better high quality of uh, wine coming from your wine lees. And just very minimal losses. There's no diatomaceous earth. We're doing all of this through mechanical separation. But probably the best advantage of using cross flow on wine lees filtration is the labor savings. Any of you guys who have operated a uh, RDV, you know better than I how difficult that can be. So this is very easy to use. This is how this stuff pencils out because you don't need the RDV. So I wanna give a couple of tips on if you are looking to purchase, uh, what are some suggestions? I can't stress enough, you saw the slide, there's 800 to 1,000 filters on the market. You have so many of your colleagues in references, and I'm sure many of them are here, and I'd love to hear from you, uh, who have CrossFlow. And talk to those people, talk to them, what do you like about CrossFlow? What are the problems, what are the, the benefits? Uh, what do you like about your supplier, what do you not like? If you're gonna do a comparison, cross flow versus what you're currently doing, be sure to keep a segment of your wine that you're gonna send for the cross flow demo, keep half of it to use whatever you're currently using, which is DE or sheets, whatever the system. It seems a bit obvious, but we've had so many demos where we filter the entire tank of wine, but the winemaker didn't have anything to compare it to. So cut the tank in half, half through your current regime, half through cross flow. If you're gonna do a demonstration, don't pick it the Sauvignon Blanc, that's really easy to filter. I know you're, if you're hesitant, you probably don't wanna use your expensive wine, but uh, doing it on an easy wine really doesn't show the benefits. Pick the most difficult wine to filter. Pick your, your Pinots or your, your Bordeaux blends that have a lot of solids. That's really where is gonna shine, and you'll see the benefits. We talked about this, make sure that you give time to the wine to recover. We talked about this probably that five to seven day. Uh, the wine will come back, but don't freak out when you initially taste the wine because it is gonna taste very different. Nate talked about this in his presentation, and it's very true for cross flow. You have to make sure that the water is clean. We've had so many instances where it's not the wine that is plugging the filter, it's dirty water. And as Nate said, you know, it could be municipal water that you think is gonna be clean is actually quite dirty. Uh, there's some pretty inexpensive systems to make sure that the water quality is in check. And water hardness in particular can be really difficult on cross flow. Check the fine print. I just have this comment up here. When you get a quote from your supplier, just make sure that you're reading over the entire quote because some of them may have specifications uh, the warranty may be voided if you're hitting it with this type of wine or this type of contaminant or, or fining agent. So just make sure that you're reading through the proposal so that everyone's clear on what the expectations are with you and the supplier. 
We offer a spreadsheet, and I'm sure our competitors do as well, that you can plug in what you're currently spending for DE, for sheets, for labor, and you can do a justification on how long would it take for you to justify the purchase of a crossflow filter. I talked about this earlier with, in terms of some of the capillary issues. I cannot stress enough getting a turbidity meter. When we quote a Bucher system, we don't even make it an option. We build it into the price of the filter. The turbidity meter is on the outlet, so it's gonna measure the filtrate. If there's any type of uh, issue with the turbidity meter jumping, that tells us we had a capillary breakage. It's gonna shut down the filter, and at this point, you still need to take the modules off and figure out which canister has my broken capillary. Some of our units, and maybe some of our competitors, you can isolate that module and keep running, but for the most part, you probably have to shut the unit down to repair it. So obviously that is some labor issues on there, but at least you're not completely jeopardizing the tank that you just filtered, so. In addition, and to follow up on your question, sir, about the, the capillaries, every time we do a cleaning cycle, the filter does a couple of tests. Number one, we measure how well did we clean the filter so that it might tell you this filter's too dirty, you gotta clean it again. It also does an integrity check so that there is even a pinhole in one of those capillary tubes after a cleaning cycle, the filter is gonna tell you you got, you got breakage. So there are some fail-safe mechanisms to help you out if you have issues. Make sure you ask the supplier about servicing. What is their recommended preventive maintenance? How many technicians do they have? Where do they keep spare parts? Uh, what happens if I need servicing in the middle of the night? Are you guys 24-7? Are you, uh, what's your availability? Just make sure that you're asking these questions when you reach out for, uh, for pricing. Great idea to get a bug catcher, get a pre-filter on the inlet, just to make sure that you're collecting any big chunks, leaves, stems, uh, bentonite, if you're uh, pulling from beneath a racking arm, having a pre-filter might catch some of these finding agents that are gonna give you uh, problems down the road. Membranes are not interchangeable, so if you purchase a Bucher system, you do have to purchase replacement modules from Bucher. If you have a Paul system, you need to get the Paul modules. Uh, I have heard there are some suppliers that are trying to change that and they're making a sort of one size fits all. Uh, I don't know how much success they've had with that, so just be a little bit cautious. So normally you do have to go to the OEM if you want to get a replacement module. That is it. Any questions about juice lees, wine lees, or just cross flow filtration in general? Sir. Average flow rate, it could be as slow as maybe 50 gallons an hour to up to 200 for a very, very large system. So you're looking at really slow flow rates. Juice Lee's, uh, it's, for our FX3 unit, I think we are running, Nate, do you know the flow rates at the top of your head? It's on our three module system. <clears throat> How does uh, excess DE in the wine that have to filtration affect the crossbow? How does that damage it? Uh, it could damage it. It is abrasive. Uh, so it, it's certainly going to plug it. It's not going to go through the capillaries. Uh, but it, it is abrasive, so it could damage some of the capillaries. So we don't recommend having uh, DE. Or just making sure that, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's one of the, the issues that. It could void the, the warranty, so we say that it's not compatible with DE. Hey, you mentioned uh, blood catchers for uh, bentonite. Uh, is there something that exists against bentonite if it's you know, pretty cloudy? It's not really any solid form? Yeah, normally the bug catchers are, they're, they're, they're pretty loose. You're only looking at about like a 15 micron. They, they might get even a little bit looser, but it's just gonna catch a slug of it. If there are trace amounts, they would go through the filter. So the bug catcher is just a very, very loose filter just to get any slug that's going through there. Our filters, and I think our competitors, can handle trace amounts of bentonite, but you certainly don't want to get a big slug of it. Uh, as I recall, we've only had one customer who plugged their modules with bentonite, but they had a four module system and they had to replace all four. So it was rather costly. Yeah. Sir. Good question. 
the lifespan, and normally the warranty is about 10 years, what's gonna dictate the life of the module is not plugging. What's gonna happen is that the cleaning cycles take a toll on the capillaries, and you're gonna find that you're making a lot more repairs. So what's gonna happen is that you're gonna get to a point where you're just constantly having to take these things off and plug straws. That's the point where it's telling you, I might need to replace these. We're seeing about 10 years. And that would be if you're operating it five days a week and you're cleaning it once a day. We recommend cleaning once every 20 hours of running time. Ma'am. The cleaning cycle, we can do either a short chemical wash or a long one. The short one's about an hour and a half. The longer one is about four hours. And you can extend that if you want a steeping time, which sometimes help. So an average about four hours. Does anyone have CrossFlow that they're willing to share any comments? Pros, cons, things they like, things they don't like? Sir. Yeah, we have one that mentioned it's really good for the water. We have a mixer, so we can get water at the temperature all the time. Nice. Good. You have clean water? Yeah, yeah. Good. Any other questions or comments on filtration? Okay, thank you guys, appreciate your time.